Welcome to the forum at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Today, on the 73rd anniversary of John Kennedy's birth, we're honored by the presence of some very distinguished men and women to discuss profiles in courage, John F. Kennedy's vision of public service. Robert Kennedy once wrote, courage is the virtue that President Kennedy most admired. Indeed, the late President's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Profiles in Courage, published in 1956, chronicled the careers of eight U.S. Senators who stood on principle against the passion of momentary public opinion and against the dictates of personal ambition. As President John F. Kennedy said that a historic quality of leadership was the courage to stand up to our enemies and the courage to stand up when necessary to our own associates. This morning, the first annual John F. Kennedy Profile in Courage Award was bestowed upon former Alabama Congressman Carl Elliott, a brave and principled public servant who fought for federal support of education and of civil rights. He suffered intense personal scorn, public abuse, and eventual political defeat, but he achieved deeper victories for the good of our nation. We're delighted that some of his family are with us today, and we're delighted to, be, to join in the accolades that others are giving to this uh, uh, superb first recipient of the John F. Kennedy Award of Profiles and Courage. The vision, yes, thank you. The vision, energy, and excitement that John F. Kennedy brought to public service lit a fire that continues to ignite succeeding generations. To begin our program this afternoon, we're honored to have with us Massachusetts senior senator, Sen Senator Edward Kennedy, a member of the Kennedy School's visiting committee of the Senior Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics, and most important, a warm friend and a wise counsel to the Kennedy School of Government and to its leadership. Please join me in welcoming Senator, Senator Edward Kennedy. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Putnam. Uh, first of all, uh, before making some uh, brief uh, comments, I think uh, all of us were very much uh, saddened to hear um, really a few minutes ago about the decision of President Bach uh, to uh, resign as uh, the president of, of Harvard at the end of the uh, academic uh, year. Uh, the, all of us, I think, who know of his uh, leadership here at uh, this university, know of his uh, strong and continuing leadership in the areas of higher education and the very uh, strong uh, leadership that he provided here at uh, Harvard University and in the field of higher education uh, generally. The members of our family uh, knew him not only as an outstanding president of a great university, but also as someone who has, by dedication and commitment, spent a great deal of time in making the president or the John F. Kennedy School of uh, Government a source of uh, excellence to hopefully attract uh, the best and the ablest and the brightest young people uh, in our nation to use their resources and intelligence uh, to improve the common good in public service. So he's been a, a good a friend to all the members of the family. He's been an outstanding uh, dean, uh, and uh, I know uh, Harvard will uh, miss his uh, leadership, and I know that uh, all of us, certainly in our family, uh, wish him uh, the best in terms of the, of the future. Let me say, I'm, Dean, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. This is the uh, first time that I've been on a panel with my uh, son, Patrick, uh, Representative Patrick uh, Kennedy. He told me he was going to give uh, the speech that uh, the bishop wouldn't let him give uh, last <laughs> week in uh, Providence uh, uh, when he was cut off from uh, speaking uh, uh, down there. And be with my fellow uh, uh, panelists. Uh, this has been a very uh, moving day for the members of our family. Today would have been President Kennedy's 73rd birthday. Uh, those of us uh, in the family uh, have always uh, wanted to have uh, the focus and the attention on President Kennedy's birthday, the hopes and ideals and dreams that he had for this country and what this country could mean 
uh, in the world uh, rather than the focus and attention at the time that he was uh, lost. So we are enormously uh, touched by uh, the expression of the people of Massachusetts uh, when they made uh, the contributions to uh, develop a wonderful statute of, uh, of my brother at uh, the State House. Uh, there uh, uh, at the place where he used to visit as uh, a young boy at the hand of uh, my grandfather, Mayor John F. Fitzgerald, that uh, really I think probably, who I think probably aroused his interest both in politics and history and uh, the extraordinary traditions of this state uh, in a very, very special way. And we had uh, what is enormously meaningful uh, experience of uh, being there uh, also earlier today at the time when uh, the first Profile and Courage Award was given to a truly extraordinary American, the person served 16 years in the Congress of the United States and really represented, and I'll come back to that in just a very brief moment, the kind of ideals of political courage that President Kennedy wrote about and believed in uh, very deeply. And again, I, I think all of us are delighted that Congressman Elliott uh, was uh, selected for the Profiles and Courage uh, Award. A very, very special uh, man, and we're delighted as well to see a number of the members of uh, his family. We had lunch earlier today, and uh, there were a number of those that said uh, each of these individuals, or some 30 of them that came up from Alabama, had been with Carl Elliott when he lost uh, for Congress, and also there when he lost when he ran for governor. Uh, and felt the uh, sting of defeat uh, and how uh, satisfying it was to uh, be there at a time uh, when uh, the real victory was going to be uh, experienced. So this was uh, an extremely important uh, occasion, and we're hopeful that uh, the award of the Profile and Courage uh, will, first of all, attract individuals into elective and public office. Secondly, to perhaps inspire individuals who do hold public office at the local, state, or federal level uh, to rise to a principle instead of uh, the enormous uh, pressures that are being experienced on all elected officials. And uh, thirdly, really, to establish, uh, or to some extent, to help establish a, a standard by which the people will judge their politicians and to raise the quality of political courage to a level in terms of our elective society which is recognized and respected and given some attention uh, by uh, the American public. And if it does that, uh, it will certainly uh, serve uh, the uh, President Kennedy's uh, memory uh, well. I had uh, intended to speak very briefly about the insidious aspects of three elements of public life today, uh, but I'm going to read uh, an editorial here. I'll mention what those are. One uh, is uh, the dedication of American political figures to polls and the insidious aspect that polls plays in the American political life. Uh, secondly, the insidious aspect that special interests uh, play primarily uh, with funds and, and money in the public life. And thirdly, uh, the mesmerizing effect on politicians of the 30-second soundbite. You take those three elements, and I think you've got to, uh, the core of at least part of the problems that we're facing with elective office uh, today. But uh, let me just, uh, in the time that remains, Dean, uh, read this uh, tale of two men. I plan to talk about that, but I think uh, political courage is perhaps, uh, as Justice Potter Stewart said, when you see it, you know it. It isn't always there in terms of pornography. You remember that uh, uh, decision uh, that uh, he wrote about. And when he was relating to pornography at that time, he said, you, maybe you can't write it down, but you'll know it when you see it. And uh, we knew it, certainly when we saw it about Congressman Elliott, or the judges knew it about Congressman Elliott. I was not on the, uh, on the judging committee. But I think this perhaps gives at least a feeling and a flavor for that time and that individual, and perhaps we talk about uh, the courage in public life. Uh, this, I think, uh, states it as well as it could be stated. This is a tale of two men from the Birmingham Post-Herald. 
And in the John F. Kennedy Library, I'm told, is a picture of George Wallace with a quote under. The quote comes from his 1960 inaugural speech. The quote, I draw the line in the dust and throw the gauntlet at the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. On Tuesday, another Alabamian, Carl Elliott, will be in the Kennedy Library to receive the first Kennedy Profile and Courage Award. Visitors will remember Elliott for his courage in the early 60s when racial turmoil shook the foundation of southern states. They'll remember Wallace for his quote signifying a stance he later said was wrong. What nuggets of irony are still being mined from these last three decades of Alabama history? They're both old now, Wallace and Elliott, ill, mostly confined to their homes, Wallace has suffered excruciating phantom pain for many years since he was shot in 1972. He's almost deaf. Elliot, 76, is a severe diabetic. He was recently hospitalized for pneumonia. He's in a wheelchair most of the time. The homes where they spend most of their time, 150 miles apart, are separated by more than distance. Elliot's is a frame house in Jasper. Boards over the front porch are rotting. In back, a rusted gutter hangs to the ground. He lives there alone. One room is a law office, although he's been unable to work for three years. Wallace lives in a modest brick house in Montgomery with Troy State University, still providing him a state salary and an assistant. Taxpayers finance state troopers to take care of him. Elliot lives on a Social Security check and donations, some from grateful people who would never have attended college without the National Defense Education Act he wrote and sponsored while in Congress between 1948 and 1964. It's interesting, people say, well, why, why was that politically courageous? I mean, all of us are for education. That was the principal instrument for desegregation in order to break up the educational institutions just after the Brown decision and was recognized not as an education, but as a civil rights issue. Alabama lost a congressman after the 1960 census, but the legislature was enabled to redraw lines to make nine districts to eight. The answer was for Democratic congressmen to run in their own district primaries, then to run statewide under a low man out plan. The one receiving the low, fewest votes lost. Wallace forces qualified a candidate against Elliott to make him spend resources in the district, leaving nothing for the statewide race. Then they ganged up on him, omitting his name from a million sample ballots. Elliott lost because he had the courage to stick by the principle that racism was wrong. That Wallace later apologized proved Elliott right too late. Elliot contributed to his problems. He went into debt running for governor against Wallace's wife and surrogate Lurleen in 1966. When his backers withdrew 30000 for a television program on election eve, Elliot took the money from his congressional retirement plan to pay for it. He finished third, and Lurleen won the governorship. There's no doubt that Wallace gang coerced the backers into withholding the money, slowly and painfully. Each stop Elliot made on the campaign trail, he received a telegram saying 10,000 was withdrawn. That Elliot once told me was the worst day of his life. It was see nice seeing an old man of courage have one of the better days of his life on Wednesday as reporters flocked to his home in Jasper. I wish I could have been there Tuesday to see him honored for his courage, but I can't. There's a gubernatorial campaign in Alabama to occupy my time one in which every candidate has courted the black vote. The winner will not snarl about segregation. On Inauguration Day, he wouldn't dare because someone had courage 26 years ago. Thank you, very <clears throat> Thank you very much, Senator Kennedy. We're also delighted to <clears throat> welcome this afternoon Patrick Kennedy, the youngest son of Senator Kennedy, and the youngest Kennedy ever to hold public office, elective office. Patrick was elected to the Royal Island House of Representatives in 1988, defeating a 10-year incumbent, and he serves on the Health, Education, and Welfare Committee. In his other life, Patrick is a senior at Providence College, majoring in political science and philosophy. Patrick? It's a pleasure for me to be here today, also on a forum with my father. When I first got involved in politics, uh, my dad said to me, um, well, 
Uh, he gave me a list of his 67 issues and told me to stay away from each one of them. Uh, he said to choose what I wanted and then he'd help me with it. So um, seriously, I, I entered public service in part because of the um, commitment that my family and the legacy that my family's had in public service, but I also entered public service because I was sick and tired of he hearing people uh, talk about my generation as the me generation. Much has been said of my generation, a generation that allegedly substitutes complacency for compassion, caution for vision, and self-interest for public interest. We've been dubbed a generation adrift, but with the start of the last decade of the 20th century comes the opportunity for a new beginning, an opportunity for the politics of resolve to replace the politics of rhetoric, an opportunity for my generation to teach lessons of human dignity as well as to dignify those who endeavor to teach us. These are opportunities my generation can't afford to dismiss. They are opportunities that carve a profile in courage. These are times when bright young men and women must step forward and show their special grace under pressure. Today, we call it doing the right thing. That is what President Kennedy's vision of political courage was. Do the right thing not the politically necessary and accepted thing. This, this ceremony is not to reminisce of political courage fan, found only in the annals of American history. It calls on us to inspire others as well as to be inspired to pursue that noble profession, public service. A public service where the desire to give is placed above the need to receive. As public servants in this new decade, we must make decisions affecting the future. As President Kennedy reminded the legislature of this commonwealth in 1961, when at some future date the high court of history sits in judgment of each of us, recording whether in our brief span of service we fulfilled our responsibility to the state, our successes or failures in whatever office we hold will be measured by the answer of these three questions. Were we, were we truly men and women of courage? Were we truly men and women of judgment? Were we truly men and women of integrity? Finally, were we truly men and women of dedication? We may be a generation without the great marches, without the identifiable social event, without the great leaders, but that does not mean we are a generation without cares and concerns. We may not have been a generation with the great leaders like President Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King, but that does not mean we cannot be touched by their memory and their commitment to bettering the lives of those in need. Admittedly, the 90s are, are not the 60s. And uh, a test of our ability is our test to sail against the political winds. We must realize that it's our environment, our quality of life that's at stake. We, we must let go of the notion that we can somehow leave the, the decisions about our future to others. As public servants, our deeds must speak louder than words. I'm reminded of what Woodrow Wilson said, no amount of dwelling upon the idea of liberty and justice will accomplish the object we have in view unless we ourselves illustrate the idea of liberty and justice. Breaking the chain through action and education is the hope for the future. But before we act and educate, we must realize the costs of today's don't worry, be happy attitude. They're too great. When I open the newspaper and read, U.S. nearly doubles thrift bailout cost estimated at $350 billion, I have to ask myself, how many Head Start programs could that fund? How many drug treatment centers could that open? How many elderly could that help? When I see young people of my age marching in the streets of Eastern Europe, Lithuania, and China, acting as the conduits of democracy, cutting profiles and courage, I wonder whether they are envious of the freedoms of America, or should we be envious, envious of their grace under pressure, their courage to risk their lives for change? It is that special grace, grace under pressure that is missing from America's public arena public servants succumbing to public pressure, taking the political response to the war on drugs. Have the public servants of today locked up their common sense and thrown away the key? It's good copy to be tough on crack dealers and drug smugglers day in and day out, 
But I fear that public servants are taking the low road by chipping away at constitutional rights, funding only new prisons, but failing to recognize that greater efforts at education and prevention may free some citizens from the prison of addiction. Today, often we put off what we should, we put off today, we put off till tomorrow what we should do today. Public servants must have the vision and courage to get the big picture, to be ahead of one's time. That's true political courage. And today's Profile and Courage Award, Congressman Elliott was certainly ahead of his time. He recognized that paving the road to a future had to begin with his time and his generation. Ahead of his time, he recognized that educational opportunity was the critical vehicle in the pursuit of a more just and caring society. Sadly, the work of Congressman Elliott and President Kennedy remains unfinished. Public servants of any endeavor, the volunteer at the AIDS hospice, the banker who seeks to end discriminatory practices, the department secretary, and even a state representative from Rhode Island must not look upon the work of Congressman Elliott and President Kennedy with an eye of nostalgia, but rather with a vision of opportunity to pursue their unfinished business. The triumphs and struggles of Congressman Elliott inspire us all to be participants in his endeavor for a better America. And in the words of Daniel Webster, another recognized profile and courage, let us develop the resources of our land, call forth its powers, build up its institutions, promote all its great interests, and see whether we also, in our day and generation, may not perform something worthy to be remembered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. The, um the skies over uh, Logan Airport have parted, and, and our uh, fourth panelist, uh, Madeline Coonan, has arrived uh, just in time. We're, we have a very distinguished uh, a panel of individuals uh, uh, today to address the question of uh, profiles and courage, the, the legacy of, uh, of uh, John F. Kennedy. And each one of them will have a different uh, story to tell about the, about the impact of uh, JFK's uh, message on them. Um, in fact, probably many of us of a certain age have, uh, have a similar story to tell. My story. Uh, includes, for example, an overnight train uh, from Philadelphia to uh, Washington to stand in the, in the back of the uh, crowd at the, uh, at the inaugural uh, on January 20th, 1961. Um, like millions of other uh, Americans of my generation, I was uh, inspired by John Kennedy's um, passionate commitment to, to public service as, a, as an honorable calling and as a, a learned profession. And like you, I'm also eager to hear the, the stories and the, uh, the views of our distinguished panelists today on this, this uh, I think, really critically important topic of, of, of courage and service in the, in the public interest. To speak first, I'm pleased to welcome back to the Kennedy School uh, Vermont Governor Madeleine Coonan, a fellow at the uh, Institute of Politics in the spring of 1983. Governor Coonan went on to become the first woman in U.S. history to be elected uh, thrice. Uh, as governor, she's been a leading national spokesperson on, on issues of the environment, uh, the economy, education, uh, and women in public service. Indeed, her address to a group of women in, in uh, elective politics here at the school in the, in the fall uh, uh, attained uh, national uh, prominence for her eloquence. And she was also a co-chair of the Democratic National Convention's Platform Committee in, 19, in 1988. Uh, Charlene hunter galt our second panelist, is national correspondent for the McNeil Lehrer News Hour and was the first black woman to integrate the University of Georgia in 1959. In the years since, uh, uh, Ms. hunter Gold has been an inspiration for political activists and for journalists alike. She's worked at the New Yorker magazine, at WRC-TV in Washington, and for a decade she was a metropolitan reporter for the New York Times. Charlene, Charlene hunter Gold has been the recipient of a great many awards, including two Emmy Awards for her coverage of the 1983 uh, Grenada, U.S. invasion of Grenada, and the Agent Orange uh, case involving contamination of, uh, during, uh, during Vietnam, and she also has received the National Urban Coalition Award for Distinguished Urban Reporting. Our third speaker is uh, a familiar friend, the director of the Institute of Politics, Charlie Royer. Charlie answered uh, John F. Kennedy's call to public service in two ways. 
one if by journalism and uh, two if by elective politics. He was originally a newspaper and a television reporter uh, and uh, then went on to, uh, to become a three-term mayor of uh, Seattle, making it certifiably uh, the America's most livable city. Um, Charlie served as president of the National League of Cities and uh, it was named one of America's top 20 mayors before coming to the IOP uh, in January and we're, uh, we've all benefited even in these, uh, in these last uh, short uh, five months from his, uh, his presence here. Our final speaker is Harvard College senior Becky Berner to reflect on public service today and the meaning of John Kennedy's call to the next generation. Becky Berner's commitment to community service is truly outstanding. She's worked to combat gang violence in the inner city. She's run a summer camp for disadvantaged youth, has tutored autistic children, has worked at the Massachusetts State Mental Hospital. She was a research assistant at the Eunice Shriver Kennedy Center, and she has served on the steering committee at the Phillips Brooks House, which many of you will know is the, the uh, locus of uh, public service uh, in Harvard College. And in the realm of public service, as well as dramatic arts, uh, Becky has uh, been a producer of an on-campus production of Children of a Lesser God. We're delighted that all of our panelists could uh, join us this evening. Each of them will speak for five minutes or so, followed by some discussion among the panelists, and then an opportunity for uh, questions and answers, give and take, uh, with the audience. So let me first of all call on uh, Governor Coonan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's um, indeed uh, wonderful to be uh, joining this distinguished group, and uh, including Senator Kennedy, in honor of John F. Kennedy's birthday, and to remember him and, and his spirit, and to seek in it some inspiration for our time. In five minutes, I will try to tell you what he meant and how I have interpreted it and why we need that spirit so badly today. Uh, I think most of all, as I try to bring myself back to that time, there was just a wonderful feeling of optimism about the political system and about government. Now, we may romanticize it a bit, and I'm sure we do, and you will have to have to kind of scrape away a layer of romanticism. But even after you do that, there still was a belief that you could get things done, that politics was fun, and there was a sense of joyousness. And I think that quality is something that is eroding today, that we forget there is that dimension, that, you know, that is part of, of the pleasure of life. Uh, and to be a full uh, and complete human being include some service uh, to one's country and to the political system. Not that it was without problems, but I think that early impression, which was a positive impression, which was a, you know, a, a optimistic impression, was so important. Because if you start out that way, then you can deal <laughs> with the negatives and the disillusionment after that, because at least you've got some, some standard there uh, to measure it by. And I shall always be very, very grateful uh, to the Kennedy family for giving my generation and hopefully future generations that kind of role model. Though I admit in some ways, as I was thinking about this on, on the plane down, that I probably at that time in my um, late 20s probably identified more with Jackie <laughs> than I did uh, with Jack in the sense that I had uh, children that age and uh, saw the whole family in a kind of glorious way. And I didn't, I didn't see myself personally as a political person at that point. I saw that as a, a vicarious uh, uh, experience, which is, which is kind of interesting how that odyssey changed from uh, seeing myself as the player instead of the observer. So maybe there's some hope that those who see themselves as observers now may be motivated to become players. And I think that is one of the real questions that the book of Profiles and Courage tried to address. I think from what I can tell upon rereading it last night is that um, Senator Kennedy then felt there was a real erosion of trust that uh, he had to restore that and show us that there were in fact real heroes and that there were people at genuine beliefs 
that they wished to espouse through the political system, that it was not all personal gain. And if he felt that that was an important message to send then, it certainly is an important message, more important than ever, to send now. Because I think today we really do see not corruption as such, but we see so much that the body politic has become sort of this empty scaffold, you know, without any interior, without any soul, without any mission. And that the fact that the perception is that people are there simply to continue being there, and that sometimes they forget why they are there. And it is this, this sense of cause, you know, that has to not only bring you into the system in the first place, but enable you to stay there. Uh, I met a, um, not too long ago, a black mayor of Mississippi at a women in politics conference. And uh, I asked the usual question, how did you get into politics? And she said, well, it was the civil rights movement, but I didn't know it was politics. It was uh, the movement itself that got her involved and kept her there for all these years. And I think that's what we have to get back to, the real underlying passionate beliefs that have always moved people, if you read Profiles and Courage, you know, it was the Civil War and, and these strong, strong feelings of justice, of causes, which when they're sort of abstracted, they look almost like cliches, but they are real. And this is what moves people. And it's almost like you shouldn't think about all the other things, like how do I do it? How do I raise the money? How do I, how do I deal with the structure of the political system? Obviously, those are important. But if you only do that and forget belief system, uh, then you end up with an empty and vacant political system that leads people to disown it and to disassociate themselves uh, from it. Today I fear that non-participation, renouncing politics, is almost considered in some quarters a courageous political act. And that, I think, is a real tragedy to our democratic uh, system. Uh, the the sense that one can only have an inner life, that one only can be true to one's values and uh, live out one's beliefs by abstaining from the political system, uh, that point of view, I think, can only apply when the political system is really totally hostile to one's own, va one's own values. And in reading uh, Francine de Plexi uh, Gray's uh, book on uh, Soviet women, uh, she made the observation, isn't it, that Soviet women are kept out of politics. They l deliberately keep themselves out of politics because they look at it with a sense of mockery. But I'm afraid some of that sense is entering here, and it's very ironic because our system is not hostile. Uh, and it, is, it can be a system that, in fact, reflects your values and extends your values and perpetuates your values. But it is that connection between self and the political system and an expansion of what one believes in and an expression of what one belie believes in that we have to reconnect so that it isn't simply an exercise, that it actually is a meaningful personal experience as well as a valuable social experience and creates social change. How you do that, I think, is the mystery, but I think, ironically, Eastern Europeans and uh, others around the world are re-educating us uh, in the process of discovering the passion of politics. Let me just conclude, because I would try to be, are you keeping time? Not so carefully. <laughs> Not so carefully. I don't, don't want to you know, fall into the syndrome that politicians so easily fall into, and uh, which also turns people off, that you just want to, to talk. But I'll just share one personal view of why I am a political person. And it's still one of the hardest questions to answer, even, even after one has run in many elections and many campaigns. You know, they're, they're kind of simple, quick answers, like the issues of the time, which I ran for the legislature first in 1972 in the state of Vermont. So the environmental issue was very uh, powerful as a motivation. My sense of timing and running in that particular year when my children uh, were still young was caused by the women's movement and I very much wanted to be part of that and that sped up my timetable. But then when I thought about it later, I don't think I really digested this till some years later and I have not fully figured it out even as I speak. 
But I think what motivated me on some other level was that I felt that I was living in a particularly fortuitous time as a woman, as a person who's not born in this country, um, and as a, as a Jew. And I must say that uh, uh, Kennedy you know, broke the barrier in terms of Catholics, and we are very grateful to that. And uh, there were some, still some perceived barriers, anyway, in terms of other religious or, or ethnic groups. And I felt that living in this particular time, that my timing was so superb, and I thank my mother for having brought me to this country. She truly was the profiling courage. But I also thought that because I left Europe with my family at the time of the Holocaust, I was not directly affected by it because we lived in Switzerland and left Switzerland, but I was indirectly affected by it because relatives of ours were killed and I do see it as the kind of central experience. And the fact that in a time of crisis, in a time when evil really surfaces, there is no protection in silence. There is no protection in abstaining from events. And I think I learned that at a very early age and absorbed it subconsciously and then put it to work when I ran for office. That is the only way I can fully explain my own political activism, that I felt that you only actually exercise some control over life by exercising your participation in the political system around you. You start out thinking you control your family, you start out thinking you protect your children, and then you find out you cannot protect your children. You may be able to protect them from crossing the street, but you cannot protect them from environmental degradation. You cannot protect them from war unless you reach out to the political system. And I've been fortunate thus far many times in finding affirmation for my beliefs in the political system. Not always. There is conflict. There is much more complexity than I'm sharing in these few moments. But I have found that, despite its difficulties, a very exhilarating experience. And I would urge this audience to try to help us rekindle that spirit that Kennedy created and created for many of my generation, that it is a hospitable system, that it is welcoming, that it is open to diversity, that there is not one politician as such of any particular mold, that it is both pleasurable, worthwhile, and that you can reconcile it with your own values, with the spiritual side of yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madeline. Charlene? Thank you very much. I love birthdays, anybody's birthday. Um, <laughs> so I really enjoy celebrating birthdays. I'm only sorry that President Kennedy's birthday is not in February when my birthday is, because that's when I think all of the great people were born. <laughs> However, I also happen to think that President Kennedy was a great American, and it's very exciting to be here to celebrate his birthday. I have to celebrate the Kennedy family, in a sense, not just limit my celebration and remarks to um, John F. Kennedy, because uh, in many ways, the lives of many Kennedys have intersected with my own. Uh, like Governor Kunin, uh, I think the first Kennedy to intersect with my life was um, Jacqueline Kennedy, not only because she was such an exquisite um, role model as she uh, did so many wonderful things um, in the White House, but the thing that was most um, important to me, um, a 19-year-old uh, living in uh, Georgia, uh, uh, starting, starting off college, um, was the fact that at a certain point, uh, Mrs. Kennedy revealed that she wore a size 10 shoe and it was the single most courageous thing I had ever heard a woman uh, uh, acknowledge. And it was the single most liberating thing for me um, during my 19th year. From that point on, I was able to wear shoes that were large enough uh, for my feet. Uh, 
thereby liberating me to concentrate on other more uh, serious matters. Uh, my feet didn't grow after that, I <laughs> must say. Uh, and it was my mother who used to tell me in any event that the fact that I wore a size 10 shoe simply meant that I was built on a firm foundation. Um, I had a conversation with Vernon Jordan uh, the other day because I was putting together a few notes about those early days when I was, as was mentioned earlier, one of the first two black students to uh, attend the University of Georgia. Uh, in 1960, we applied in 1959. We actually were admitted by court order in uh, 1961, and it wasn't the most hospitable of, um, of moments in my life. Uh, when we arrived at the campus, we were greeted by a reception committee. I'm not sure that all of them were hostile, but it was difficult to, uh, to tell. Uh, some of the epithets you may have heard if any of you saw Eyes on the Prize or have read various historical accounts. I won't go into them now, but they weren't, again, as I said, the most um, hospitable yeah. of greetings. So I called Vernon the other day. Vernon Jordan was... Um, at that time, a law clerk. He was beginning his law career. As many of you know, he went on to become uh, head of the United Negro College Fund, then head of the National Urban League, and has had a distinguished uh, career in public uh, life. He's now in private law practice, but still involved in many important uh, public issues and causes. And I called him up and I said, um, Vernon, um, do you remember uh, when we went the, the very first day at the University of Georgia, and we were surrounded by all of these crowds. It was you and my mother and me. I said, but I've never known who the people were who were protecting us, you know, where, where they were, where they were positioned, and I, I wanted to just sort of clarify that in my mind, where the federal agents were, where the Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents were, all the people who were there and exactly who they were. And there was this long pause and he said, you mean you didn't know? I said, I didn't know what? He said, it was your mother, you, and me. <laughs> and I said, you have got to be kidding. And he said, no, the only three people uh, that day walking onto that, that part of the campus for you to um, register with the three of us. And I remember my mother is not a very tall person. Vernon Jordan must be about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and I'm 5'8", and my mother must be about 5'4". And as we hustled from one building to the other, followed by these pursuing, chanting crowds, my mother kept saying, listen, you guys have the long legs. I just have the short legs. You have to slow down. And we kept saying, but we don't want to slow down. <laughs> But I, I recall that, um, that anecdote because I think as incredulous as I was when Vernon told me uh, the other day that the three of us were, were quite alone, I think that one of the reasons I have not known all of these years and, and didn't really think about it uh, much all of these years is because one of the things that gave us, all of us, children of the civil rights movement pursuing where it, uh, freedom and justice and equality wherever we happen to be because many of my friends were off in sit-ins and freedom rides and uh, doing all sorts of things to challenge the, uh, the system in those days. I think that one of the things that gave us courage not only w was that we were all sort of of the same mind about uh, the importance of putting our bodies on the line to, to achieve uh, justice and equity. Uh, for, for particularly blacks in the South at that time, but indeed for all people. But I think that we also felt that we were going to be taken care of. Now, obviously that didn't happen in every single situation, but there was a spirit and a mood in the country from the very highest levels that made us all feel that uh, somehow, somewhere, there would be somebody taking care of us and would not let anything uh, happen to us. Shortly after we uh, completed this phase of our um, efforts to desegregate the university, Robert Kennedy um, came to the University of Georgia. 
uh, the crowds that were there to greet him were only slightly less hostile uh, than those who had greeted um, my entry to the university because um, the people who were the no, the no not ones and the never, uh, never allow anyone uh, black into any of these institutions, the people who took those positions were as hostile to uh, the federal government as they were to us and indeed felt that John F. Kennedy and his ilk uh, were forcing people like me uh, down their throats. So that when the president sent um, Robert Kennedy to, um, to speak at the law school at the University of uh, Georgia the spring, I guess it was, um, after we had entered, uh, it was not a very hospitable uh, climate for him. Um, I was curious as to how Senator Kennedy was going to, um, to handle this, and uh, I managed to get a seat in the auditorium, and you have to uh, remember uh, that out of a campus of 20,000 students, uh, there were two black students, and wherever we went, we managed to uh, stand out. But I was determined to hear this uh, speech and so I managed to get inside of the auditorium and um, at, at, a, at a very good um, position where I could see uh, Senator Kennedy speaking. And he started, um, he got a standing ovation as he was, was introduced and he proceeded with his speech to talk about um, what John F. Kennedy's administration stood for. And as the speech unfolded, he made it clear in no uncertain terms that this administration was going to uphold the law of the land and it was going to protect the rights of citizens like, and then he mentioned us by name, Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes, to attend the institutions of their choice. And then he went on to say that he felt that our graduation, indeed, from the University of Georgia would be a major uh, advance uh, in the war against communism and the move towards freedom and justice and equality throughout the world. Well, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was not expecting that kind of a speech and uh, neither were um, the other people assembled in the room because um, when Senator Kennedy finished, he was Attorney General Kennedy at the time, finished the speech, the standing ovation that he had gotten at the beginning um, of his, at, at the, at his introduction uh, was not uh, the uh, reaction that he got when he had, had concluded. So that um, I was inspired uh, by his courage to come as it were into the belly of the beast and to say that this is the law of the land and it's going to be upheld and we will do all that we can within our power to see that no harm uh, comes to any of these young people. It was a tremendously inspiring uh, moment for me and uh, needless to say, I have told that story uh, many, many times um, hence because I, I feel that uh, it was truly one of the remarkable moments uh, in, in, in the history of, of that moment, of that time. Um, it was the impulses of that movement uh, during that time, people inspired by people like that, um, that, that I think in, inspired my own journalism, uh, that indeed made me feel that, well, journalism, I think, had made a difference in the coverage of the civil rights movement. I think that the civil rights movement would have succeeded in time, but I do think that the presence of reporters, particularly television, uh, was very instrumental in advancing that movement and, and saving a lot of, of lives. We lost some uh, in the process, but I think the fact that television was there, I think the fact that we had a national leadership uh, willing to say that the law of the land is going to be obeyed uh, regardless uh, were all positive factors in bringing that to, bringing the movement to a positive um, uh, conclusion. Um, what impact it has had on my life and career I, I, since that time is that I have a standard 
um, by which I judge everything that I do and a standard by which I measure the rest of the media. And I certainly can um, more than sympathize with um, Senator Kennedy's comments at, at the beginning of this, this forum about the impact of the 30-second soundbite. I can also um, empathize with those who feel that journalism has in many ways lost um, some of its, its moorings. I mean, once upon a time, there was a, a journalist who said that the pur purpose of, of journalism should be to um, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I think that um, a lot of us, and I'd like to think of myself as an exception, but a lot of us have, been very, have become very comfortable uh, in, in, in our uh, positions in, in journalism. A lot of us make far too much money um, and, and therefore fail to remember what I believe our mission uh, in life is, that is to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, to, uh, to, to make sure that every human being, every human face has a voice, every human face is a face that can be recognizable, uh, can be recognized by himself or herself. Uh, too much of our journalism today is um, journalism that reports on people who are not recognizable uh, to themselves. Um, and so I remain um, in many ways challenged uh, by that period in time when we did, we were able to give human voice uh, to those who otherwise would have no access, uh, to those who were afflicted either with a lack of access to, uh, to schools or to um, even to run for public office. Uh, in those days, uh, the, the notion of anyone who uh, looked like me in any parts of the South uh, where the movement was in full flower uh, was just, um, it was, it was not, not, not thinkable. And so those instincts, those impulses uh, remain with me uh, today. And um, I'm just delighted to be here and share some of um, the memory of, of how those impulses were fashioned with you and hope we can pursue some other aspects of it in the question and answer period. Thank you very much. I had known that, uh, that uh, like all of the uh, panelists, um, uh, Charlene was a role model, but I had not quite realized quite how big her shoes would be to fill. Um, <laughs> Mine are size 13. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, will try to, uh, try to move this along because my full-time job is to work in this wonderful building here and to try to use the uh, experience uh, of President Kennedy to find ways to inspire young people to get into politics. As the director of the Institute of Politics, which was set up as a living memorial to President Kennedy, uh, my mission is elegantly uh, simple. It is simply to uh, find ways to help young people become excited about the concept, the reality of public service and political life, particularly elective politics. I think the best way for me to explain um, myself is to um, use two incidents completely unrelated in time or place and completely out of sync uh, with each other, which tells me something about the pace of change in our society and uh, the opportunity for inspiration that lies out there in the future for uh, our young people. And I was struck uh, this afternoon by the uh, how old I'm getting um, when I saw Patrick speak uh, again because uh, I had the pleasure of hearing Patrick uh, at a fundraiser in Boston uh, last week as he introduced uh, Ted Mondale, uh, son of Walter, who was running for the state senate in Minnesota. 
And uh, Patrick did a wonderful job in introducing um, another son who is using that example, who has benefited from that example of a role model uh, in politics, uh, who is in there uh, himself. And there are so many others, uh, Joe and Robert. Uh, there are uh, around uh, the country uh, many young people whose parents uh, have been in politics or who have been in medicine or have been in law who follow uh, their parents' examples. And it seems to me that uh, for those of us whose parents did not happen to be president or United States senator or vice president, that we need to look to other icons that we need to have, and we are blessed with, uh, other role models um, to look to. Other people in the world are not so fortunate. Uh, unrelated case number one. I was just in Romania observing the elections there. Young people in that country have no tradition of political leadership, of inspiration to look to, because for 50 years, there has been no opportunity for them to participate. In fact, the notion of participation, the notion of freedom, uh, has been systematically, with the emphasis on system, beaten out of them. So that today in Romania, those young people standing in the square um, are taking inspiration from themselves, from each other, and are looking to this country and its rich tradition of political leadership for inspiration. Each and every young person asked me, what are they saying about us in the United States? Do they know what's going on here in the United States? Uh, are they interested in what's happening to us? And yes, we are. Unrelated incident number two, someone to add to that to the name of Carl Elliott to, um, unfortunately, to so many people in the United States, was not known or remembered uh, during this very tough period in his life, this period uh, <coughs> following his political, quote, defeat. Another relatively unknown person was the speaker at a high school graduation in Oregon City High School, which I'm sure you are all aware of. Uh, major metropolis uh, located just outside Portland, Oregon. Uh, 500 students in the school. Uh, and at the graduation ceremonies in 1957, a wonderful, fiery young man uh, named Monroe Sweetland, who was probably the biggest name that Oregon City High School could attract for its graduation because he uh, was a state representative, came to uh, my graduation and spoke uh, so eloquently of being in the fight, a small town newspaper publisher, uh, a citizen legislator in that wonderful citizen legislature that Oregon uh, still tries to, to hold on to where people actually go to Salem, Oregon, the capital and stay for a few months and make wonderful law and then go home. Uh, he spoke with such um, fire about being in the fight. And the fight then was against the right wing uh, in my home state of Oregon, which thought that uh, Monroe Sweetland was a communist. And over a period of three or four or five years, had pretty well beaten uh, Monroe Sweetland's life into a less than um, uh, secure, financially secure, uh, and rosy life. Uh, lost the newspaper, um, family um, uh, with the charges in the newspaper that he was a communist. Imagine those uh, just some uh, less than 40 years ago with communism crumbling around the country in Oregon City, Oregon. The issue was, is State Representative Monroe Sweetland a communist? At that point in my life, in 1957, um, I decided to become a uh, newspaper reporter. 
a reporter and um, with very little thought of going into politics because President Eisenhower was the president. He was a wonderful man. Um, even my um, staunchly democratic father thought he was a good guy. Um, but not until 1960 did it ever occur to me that the place to use that Monroe Sweetland energy uh, was in the pursuit of elective uh, office. Let me just conclude by saying that watching what's happening around the world today, people without these marvelous institutions, such as Carl Elliott and Monroe Sweetland and John F. Kennedy, to look to for their inspiration. Their blood is boiling. Uh, their hearts are on fire. They're in the streets. Um, saying words that send them to jail and get them shot, while politicians in our country uh, are uh, becoming famous uh, for refusing to say such volatile and uh, dangerous words as taxes and uh, liberal. Hopefully, we will all, through the kind of systematic collection of the memories of our great political institutions, such as John F. Kennedy, in institutions like this and with people uh, like Becky Burner, whom you're going to hear from now, um, live up to the challenge uh, of the future um, because we have so much uh, on, from which to draw uh, in our immediate uh, past. It is a real pleasure to be here on my uh, um, first year at this marvelous institution where we talk like this every single day. Thank you. <laughs> I'm honored to be here today um, among panelists who show me, someone from my generation, um, what commitment and dedication to service um, can lend to people throughout the world. Um, I can only speak for myself and what I've seen on campus here, um, the public service that I've done here. Um, I was struck recently by reading um, a column in a, in a book that a, my roommate gave me by Ellen Goodman, who's a Boston Globe columnist, which is perhaps the largest um, public service organization on campus, but not the only one. Um, along with those other programs um, here at Harvard, several homeless shelters are staffed, 10 summer day camps run serving about 300, 400 children. Um, prison GED programs operate. AIDS visitation happens. Um, peer hotlines occur. Um, my time would be up just by listing, listing all of the different involvements that students just at this campus alone are doing. Um, thousands of students each week are running quality programs and providing quality service to communities, both in Cambridge and Boston. But although we come to these same programs for diverse reasons, once there we strive to work together to provide a quality program for the community to run programs that empower people. Ultimately, we agree as students that we gain more than we have ever given. Um, we learn about ourselves, about the economic and social realities of our society, about working with people of diverse backgrounds, not only our peers, but also the people in the community. I'm sure that many of my companions in service work would agree with me when I say that public service has been the single most important educational experience of my Harvard years. I found from my own experience that my peers, my generation, is exercising great courage. The public service that I've seen my peers do requires that a person be willing to learn about him or herself, be willing to face one's own prejudices. A person in entering a community to work with other people must, be open one, must open oneself to giving and to receiving, must become vulnerable and form a relationship, and recognize that you will impact another life. He or she may feel threatened or be vulnerable in the environment in which she enters or serves and may need to advocate for change in the face of resistance. It takes courage to act when one feels something is wrong, to strive th to make things better, not just to remain complacent. I've seen all these things done by my peers here at Harvard, and one friend reminded me today of the context in which we do public service, that taking the easy route in college usually means taking classes. But the people who do public service here and on other college campuses are risking and taking the chance to grow, to know that they will affect others and be re relied upon by others. 
It takes courage, most importantly, to continue serving, although it is impossible to measure how behavior is altered or how lives are changed. In this society, and sometimes at this campus, courage is being concerned with making a difference rather than making the ultimate impression. Ellen Goodman reminded us that even greater courage, moral courage, is required if one is to go beyond the soup kitchen to actively working for positive social change, to question why homelessness occurs rather than just serving a meal. Despite the outreach to the community here at Harvard, the majority of, of us, that, that the majority of us have done here, there's still a belief sometimes that public service in my generation is something that you do at college, not necessarily a career choice. A peer of mine said that there are people who do that kind of work, and there are people who fund that kind of work. Unfortunately, to him and to most, the belief still exists that you must choose one or the other. Here at Harvard, the call is issued by the recruiters. Go for the gold was last year's class motto. To my parents, the choice is obvious. There are certain careers that a Harvard education is for. The ones with prestige, the ones with financial stability, the ones with advances, the ones that usually come from the private sector. Next year, I think I'll be going to Mexico and um, working in community development there. But, and I've gotten quite a bit of flack from my parents. Um, but I know that they're not the only ones. I think the pressure is equal for all the students here, whether from upper or working class, from middle or lower class backgrounds. When we as Harvard students leave this campus with our diplomas on June 7th, I hope, we will undoubtedly be taking positions with influence. Our decisions in, in those jobs will impact people's lives. Policies must be made and enacted with responsibility to the community. If we as students, if I may speak for the peers that I see here today, hope hope to exercise what we have learned from our public service involvement. It is that social responsibility only comes from direct involvement in and knowledge of the community. Long-term working solutions are only found with community empowerment. Our generation definitely does need a call to public service, one will which will abolish the forced choice myth. One must not just be involved in the private sector, but can be involved in the public sector simultaneously. One can also choose the public sector as a career choice. I have seen the necessary courage of my peers. The idealism is not lacking, but rather what is lacking is the needed reinforcement. The call must come, but it also must be accompanied by incentives, by training, by resources, and most importantly, by validation that working with people is something that we should do so students and others can choose to make a career of their social service and their social action. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Becky, and thanks to all of the uh, panelists. In a moment, we'll have an opportunity for, um, for uh, questions uh, and responses and comments from the audience. But I'd like to begin, if I can, by uh, turning to uh, any or to all of the members of the panel uh, with a question that's inspired both by um, uh, Patrick's remarks at the opening and by Becky's uh, uh, concluding remarks. There are people in, now who think they detect um, in a, in a variety of uh, bits and pieces of evidence, some change in this uh, decades-long um, climate of hostility to public service. Um, partly that's, I think, because we're, we're, we're past a period in which uh, we had uh, several successive presidents that ran against uh, uh, ran against government uh, as part of their uh, as part of their uh, campaign. Partly, I think it is the uh, example that um, that all of us have felt of, of these Eastern Europeans who were engaging in, in public service of a very um, very real sort. Um, I know that applications of, of schools of public service like ours around the country are in fact up quite substantially over the last year or two compared to previous years. On the other hand, I know that, uh, that uh, many of us uh, continue to feel that uh, there isn't yet that, uh, that uh, fire and passion that, that there was, uh, that many of us benefited from when we were, when we were in, in college because of the example of John Kennedy. So the question I'd like to pose to any of the panel who want to respond is whether you, what, how you read the, uh, 
the, the, the signs in, at the moment. Is there, is there a renewed interest in, in, uh, in public service of a, of a full-blooded sort or, or not? Is that, uh, is that hope uh, still vain? Patrick? Yeah, um, well, I think I benefit a lot from coming from a family that's very politically uh, active, so I'm very aware and of politics and my community and so forth. But um, I, I read the article in the Globe a couple of weeks ago that was talking about a generation that's just uh, dropped out because they've grown up during the Reagan era. That, you know, growing up through their uh, teen years, all they've had is one president, Ronald Reagan, and so they haven't had that calling. And um, I think that why we're here today is because President Kennedy gave leadership, and we haven't seen leadership from the Oval Office, and that's where I think it should come from. That's where it does come from. That's where the, the White House is what sets the tone for this country. And for the last decade, um, they have set a tone that says, go out and make for what you, you want for yourself. That's the American dream, go out and do what you can for yourself. The uh, uh, complete antithesis of what President Kennedy uh, called for this um, country. So I think that, yes, there is a, a you know, there has been a great, um, apathy and so forth, but that's because of a lack of leadership. And I think that the generation before us has are as much uh, to hold accountable for that as we ourselves growing up in our generation are to be held accountable for that. Um, so that. Back, Becky. I think it's also something that, that um, is recently being addressed, particularly in the communities with a lot of um, peer programs, peer education programs, peer training programs. Um, where funds are provided, like for instance in Boston by ABCD, um, to individuals um, who are teens who are able to then work in public service jobs um, and be role models for younger children coming along. Um, I think it is a question of, of resources very often um, at Harvard for my peers to even become involved in public service. Um, without work study funds, for instance, um, the, the mandatory public service bill that you know, would have required people um, you know, to do, you know, public service, um, things such as that aren't providing opportunities for people to get involved. Now, things like work study funds um, and peer education programs and community programs can provide that, um, the necessary impetus um, in addition to, I think, leadership from the Oval Office would really help, so. I'd just like to uh, ask both of you something. Um, do you think students make, I think it's great that there is this change and that you see that resurgence and I, I detect it as well and I think it's a, you know, something to really applaud and support in every way. But then we see these other signs and symptoms of, of greater, you know, disenchantment with the political system and fewer people voting and more hostility and the feeling that people tune it out. What do you see among students there? Do they make a real distinction between public service in terms of helping the homeless and the po larger political system, which is out there also designed to do something about that? Yeah, the, the problem I think you're bringing up is that the political system is, hasn't been designed to do that. Um, and we talked a lot and we're talking a lot about the passion that President Kennedy offered to this um, generation before us. And we're talking about, well, how can we reignite this passion? And it's interesting because it, we're unique in this country in that um, we, we have one ideology. And uh, we don't have this class um, conflict that, w that is an existent in other countries where if you come, if you're someone from France, you can be, um, believe one thing and not be called an un-Frenchman like. Whereas if you're in this country and you say um, the uh, disparity between rich and poor is outrageous and an injustice and we ought to do something about it and take a realistic look at things, well, you can't say that because uh, under our ideology, you know, we're supposed to have uh, opportunity, everybody's supposed to be able to um, make what they want and when they get it, you know, to hold on to it and to you know, I mean, we've seen the accumulation of wealth by a very small section of our population, over, uh, particularly over the last uh, couple of years. And so what I think I'm trying to get around to the, addressing your question, and that is people don't see a choice. They don't see a choice. And uh, as we're constantly called as Democrats 
to moderate our views, to go to the um, middle of the road, and everybody's sort of become, and then Bush is more not real far right, so everyone's centrist. Well, where's the choice? There is no choice in elections, and I think that has a, enough to do with it, and the reason there's no choice has been there's, there's been no political leaders who have come out and, and stated a point of view and been admired for stating it clearly and concisely that offers a choice. So, and, and we've talked, my father was mentioning that. There's the 30 second soundbite, there's the pollsters and so forth. That has led politicians to uh, just not say anything that'll, that'll hurt them, while at the same time giving up the opportunity to say something that'll create some discussion. Just to clarify my own interpretation of your answer, you're saying that this, this resurgence of public service does not get transferred to the political system. No. So while there, there may be um, you know, a, a nice altruism and laudable, uh, there's still a vacuum as far as political participation. Yeah. I think that's tragic. Yeah. But I think what, um, I don't think that pu pu public service fell out of fashion in, after the 1960s. I think that what happened was it was rechanneled. It was rechanneled into the communities, and your um, leadership um, in taking f uh, strong action on the environment is an example. We've we focused refocused in our communities, and what Becky was saying in her speech was that, well, no, don't don't berate us because we um, students are doing a lot in public service. I think that's true, and I. So what I'm saying is that. Um, I don't think there's been a lack of commitment to their community. It's just that there hasn't been that national movement. And so I don't think we should sort of totally, you know, say that the last um, 10 or 15 years have been, you know, devoid of any public action. It's just occurred at the local level at Seabrook. It's occurred, you know, in my community against a coal-fired power plant called New Bay. You know, that's where people are getting involved, not so much, you know, on the national movement level. Well, I, just uh, just very briefly, I think that uh, Governor Cunin's point, uh, as well as Patrick's, I think makes uh, a good deal of sense. I don't think there's any question that there's an enormous revitalization of uh, activity in, in local uh, communities. I mean, one of the phenomenons that we see now, and uh, we've seen it in our Human Resource uh, Committee, our Labor Committee, is that 10 years ago, if you were, for, you were for, say, a national program, and people would say, well, let's let the local communities do it, let's let the states do it. And uh, the Republicans would be saying, let's let the states do it, and the Democrats trying to get whether, whatever it might be. I mean, you're talking about things which are generally health and safety legislation, medical device legislation, okay? Now we have seen activities in the states uh, the proposition was at 67 in California on the pesticides issue, Big Green, California. Uh, protection here in Massachusetts on the pesticides issue. Uh, you're getting activity in local communities on smoking. We have a prohibition at the national preemption from local communities passing legislation on smoking uh, and for states to pass legislation. Interesting, a number of the communities have, and it hasn't been challenged by the tobacco industry. They don't want to level, raise this. So now, in our Human Resource Committee, we have the Republicans saying, let's preempt the states so that we, on pesticides, food safety, on smoking. What we want to do is preempt them so we can have one standard. And we're saying, let's let the states do their thing. Um, you know, it's in a, and to a great extent, to get back to the question, is because of local involvement. Too many have given up at the national level, are active at the uh, local community, active in the states, and are moving. And uh, I think that this is uh, a very interesting phenomenon, I think, has changed. And secondly, I think it's uh, important to, in providing opportunities for, for service. You know, uh, uh, I just mentioned, and then in close, quickly, we had an announcement of a little uh, uh, a, uh, program for homeless with AIDS, $130,000. Very, but part of the McKinney bill, very nickel and dime program. We did it and announced it down in, in Chinatown at that center, food center down there. I went in there and I asked people who were running it. I said, well, where's your paid staff? Where are you getting? We don't, they said, we want to show you the list of volunteers, 
People from downtown Boston that come in, don't want their names on anything, just want to come on in here and work. And you're finding that, finding that true. Laura knows we need them because of what's happening in social services in the society. But very, very interesting. You're finding that out and, and around, and I think if we provided some opportunity in the schools. Phillips Brooks House is marvelous. I mean, I, when I was here, I went to but let me raise a question just to end it. I don't understand why the universities can't tie this, these kinds of programs into the academic aspects of students. We have a, a lot of, a, uh, I, I'm the author of a, of a teacher core program. We've got seven colleges. Uh, this year we're going to have 200. Seven colleges, a nickel and dime program, 20 million nationwide, just to stimulate, to set up administratively in the college so kids can go and teach. You know, we've got marvelous volunteers at the Phillips Brooks, and that's fine. We've got seven colleges in Boston that would do it. They took the, the, the $25,000 that it took them to get it was to tie it in so it was academically relevant to their, the, the area in which they were studying. That has had an impact in those schools where the number of kids that have volunteered to go into the teacher core program, where the schools have tied the, the the program into the areas of study and made this interesting. And you know, I think the institutions, whether we're talking about the medical institutions, whether we're talking about the educational institutions, whether you're talking about the business institutions, ought to be reaching out. That's an aspect of public service uh, too. And I don't think, you know, any of us have done as well as we should in trying to do it because I think that the, uh, the country uh, needs it and that aspect of public service could come from those various institutions as well as from individuals. I think, I think also um, to add to that and to address Governor Coonan's remark is that programs like that um, are what will make the difference and make the connection for students like myself, um, not only at the college level, but also in high school um, and also in elementary school. The connection between what is happening on a national level and how you know, economics and politics impact the community that they're serving um, through different kinds of public service programs, and that's where the effort needs to be made. Hi, I'm Bruce Goldberg, and I'm a junior in the college and a member of the Student Advisory Committee at the Institute of Politics. And my question today relates also to this idea that when we look for political courage today, we tend to look to the local areas. I think of someone like David Dinkins and his recent handling of the difficult crises that they're having uh, in intergroup mediation. And I look at him as someone who's a leader in politics today. But um, my question is really how we can tie that into the national level and what the chances are that there will be some kind of national program to provide the funds and the reinforcement for a lot of the energy and creativity that we're seeing at the more local areas. We have a national service a program, legislation's passed the Senate. Uh, 76 to 12, where the administration indicated they were going to veto it. Now they don't think they will. Expect to have markups in the House uh, in the next uh, three weeks. I think we'll pass it and have the president sign it. And it has about six different programs. I'm not going to bother you with the details on it. But I'll, I'll, I'll mention just one aspect of it. Um, the, the, the idea of having the six programs is that we try and put a net out, find out which one can attract people into public uh, a community service and then do an evaluation of that and hopefully enhance those programs down the road that work. One of them is the school-based program uh, to develop kinder K through 12 voluntary programs. They've got it out in Springfield, Massachusetts. Different from our program is it's required there. Uh, ours is not mandated. They have kindergarten children folding napkins to the feeding program. They have fourth graders that uh, adopt uh, someone in a nursing home they have one thing to do every day, call that person, spend five minutes on the phone, and visit that individual on Valentine's Day and on their birthday. They have seventh graders that do pantomimes and go out to the elderly homes. That place is, you know, what it has done in terms, they have ninth graders that go down to a center for, get children uh, after school uh, before their parents pick them up. It's under supervised and a, a care program, but they got the kids in there uh, involved in that program. And, uh, this is working. Uh, there, there's a very effective program uh, in Serve Vermont where they did uh, alcohol-free graduations. Students came on down. They got $100 grant, and that $100, I don't, uh, Governor Cunin can tell you about it, but that $100, those students went and wrote the various uh, businesses in their community, uh, got to solicitation, so they had alcohol-free graduation. None of the schools heard about it, and uh, they got uh, a number. I heard it was somewhat around 20 
uh, high schools just with this one student out there cooking. And uh, we want it to be truly voluntary, but there, in, in some instances, there have to be corridors or at least seed resources to get them uh, going, and I think we'll get that at least signed uh, into the law. It's not going to do all the answer. We can't, but at least it uh, will, I think, uh, energize, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, a, a program that can offer something that can be meaningful for community service. Uh, I've been reminded by my staff that I should be careful, attentive to the time, so that uh, we'll take uh, we'll take one last uh, question. Charlie, do you want to speak for, first on this? Just, uh, to another um, uh, piece of the uh, question that Bruce uh, raised as a, a person working um, in 12 years in local government. Uh, I saw lots of extraordinary leadership, lots of programs that worked, um, lots of political people who. Um, courageously, uh, in my own uh, part of the country, uh, stood up uh, early against the uh, Anita Bryant uh, anti-gay initiative who took uh, a courageous political stand <clears throat> on some pretty unknown turf uh, and helped uh, others uh, to um, find the courage uh, in the community to take a similar stand. Leadership does not necessarily have to be top-down, and it doesn't have to be an elected official who provides it. Uh, in my own case, uh, I now take full credit for uh, uh, a wonderful community clinic system that uh, was uh, set up in my city through the uh, entrepreneurship of people working in the private nonprofit sector who went out and raised money and who created a system that we were able to invest large sums of uh, both public and private money in to create the National Health Care System of Seattle, which uh, not only is a program that works, but is, um, uh, is political uh, courage and leadership from the very grassroots created it. And I think that's helpful. And hopefully a thousand uh, uh, flowers will bloom out there in, uh, uh, in the country with regard to um, this kind of leadership, because national leadership can then look around and say, well, Here's a politician in this part of the country who stood up for this thing, who uh, went out and raised taxes to build housing for AIDS patients, or who uh, created a health system that works in this corner of a state or in this city, and maybe it's all right for me, running for president or running for the United States Senate, uh, to take uh, uh, that similar position. It's not political suicide for me to do it. So I think a lot of that is happening, and some of the most inspirational political leadership in the country has occurred, is occurring out there at the grassroots levels and in the public, uh, in the private nonprofit organizations. I might just, if I could, since the question was on voluntary service, one of the insp inspiring people, my sister Eunice is over here, started the Special Olympics program all over the country from uh, grassroots level. <laughs> If the, if the panelists will uh, promise to be brief, I'll, uh, I'll allow one, uh, one last question. Yes. Senator Kennedy, obviously the message here today is for young people uh, to get involved in politics and public service. But you yourself and a number of the other panelists have pointed out problems with sound bites, the cost of running campaigns. Isn't it to some extent the responsibility of, of you and your leaders, fellow leaders in the Senate and in the governor's mansions to somehow fix this system so that young people will be encouraged to run, not discouraged to run for public office? Well, there's uh, certainly a, sure. Uh, I think uh, there's certainly, uh, there's, there's a good deal that, uh, that you know, that we can uh, do. Uh, you know, some of us thought last time, uh, last time I was up for a lecture, I thought maybe see if we get five senators that would not spend any money, try and do that across the country, try and make the issue the money in the course of the, uh, the campaign. I mean, I think we can be perhaps, uh, that, you know, that is not the whole answer, but to try and put a, you know, to, to try and perhaps by example say, okay, if we think this, the, the funding and the mechanism is so bad, we're not to do it. Uh, some senators have tried to use in their uh, campaigns, use them for educational purposes. I mean, Br Bill Bradley, for example, uh, has raised a, a great deal of money, I mean, eight or nine um, million dollars. That's a hell of a lot of money, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and what he does, you know, what we uh, attempted uh, to do but uh, in the last campaign, is try and use that as an educational experience. I mean, if you take a look at his, uh, at his um, 
campaign material, it, it's really an educational kind. It takes one or two issues. And I think we can do more than that. The answer is certainly uh, we should. And uh, I think some are giving thoughts to it. Uh, but uh, my comments about the dangers of the 30-second to bite, uh, the complete uh, uh, you know, slavery to, to polls is that, you know, the reality. I mean, we'd like to have that change, and it ought to be changed. But quite frankly, if the public isn't going to demand that we change it, uh, then we're not going to change it. We had, as the uh, sponsor of, uh, with uh, Senator uh, uh, Stafford and Senator Scott, a number of years, 1974, in the wake of Watergate, a public financing campaign. We broke a filibuster on it, passed it. House, Senate, and presidential elections. We could, you, wouldn't, uh, you couldn't have got 10 votes for that last year. Because the public say, you want to use my taxpayers' money for the corrupt aspects of American politics? You must be kidding. I think it's more this year. You may be up to 25 or 30 votes. But that's out there. Now, how we can alter a change, it's still my position of public financing, but how you change, you know, there's an attitude. It, they, it's mutually uh, sort of reinforcing. We ought to do better. We ought to be demanded uh, to do more. Well, I want to um, thank all of the panelists for uh, participating in this uh, celebration. Uh, I think uh, Governor Coonan made the point uh, quite uh, eloquently that uh, it's not merely the uh, moral commitment to public service, but the joy of public service that John Kennedy was about. And uh, it's that sense of, uh, of joy that we uh, celebrate uh, this anniversary of his birth. And, and again, thanks to all of the panelists.